So good to see you on this one. I'm curious, drop it in the comments below. Do you know him best as Ken Kennedy, Ken Anderson, or Mr. Let me grab the microphone for this. I dropped something. Kennedy. Kennedy. Before you write your answer and before we get into this, a huge thank you to Upstart for sponsoring this video and for always supporting the channel. If you're struggling with credit card debt and carrying that payment over month to month with those high interest rates, that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart has helped over 1.8 million customers on their path to financial freedom. Whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or just funding personal expenses, Upstart can help you get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. And Upstart knows you're more than just your credit score. So rather than just looking at your credit score alone, Upstart's model considers other factors like your income, your employment, and other information you put on your application so they can help get you a smarter rate for your loan. You can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 to $50,000 without impacting your credit score. And you can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. So don't wait, check your rate today by going to upstart.com slash CVV. It's also down there in the description and the pinned comment. It's upstart.com slash CVV. And make sure to use our link so they know that we're the ones who sent you over there. Where did we send you? We sent you to upstart.com slash CVV. Ken, yes, we're making this happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, I love being here. Thank you. I love talking to you. When we were setting this up and you were like, yeah, um, you know, any day between 6 p.m. and 2 a.m., I'm at the school, like at your wrestling school, at the academy. I'm like, you're there till 2 a.m. on weekdays? Yeah, yep. Pretty much every day. Um, the class runs until it, we have uh, beginners classes that are 6 to 9 and then 9 to 12. And there's usually we go the full distance and they don't get any like ring time. So I always like at the end of the night at midnight, I, I let them just goof around. And, and I figure that it's uh, if you're being productive and sometimes being productive is just sitting around and BSing about the business sure. with like-minded people. Yeah. If you're being productive, might as well use the space, you know, it's, it's here. We're paying so, rent on it. So, so if you're there till 2am, what time do you get to bed? And then what time do you wake up? Uh, like 4 a.m. And then it depends. Like some days I have to go in and train early. I, I trained some other clients earlier in the day. Like yesterday I had to train somebody at noon. Um, a couple times a week we do 2 p.m. So it's, it's, it varies. It's usually like I get to bed around four and then I'm up around 11 or 12. Um, so I had you up early today for this interview because we're doing this at noon your time. No, actually I, I woke up today. I was I woke up at like 9 a.m. this morning. I was raring to go. I, I nipped up out of bed. I gave my wife a flying head scissors. And <laughs> I think it's so important to point out, like there's a lot of people that are going to be watching this or listening to this that want to go to a great wrestling school. And I think it's so important to point out, like if you want to go to a wrestling school, you want to go and be trained by someone who's been to the place that you want to be, like someone like you, who's been in WWE, been in TNA, been in NWA, like you've had an amazing career. You know the inner workings of not just what goes on in the ring, but what goes on behind the scenes too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I will say this, that I, uh, I don't regret not being trained by somebody that made it to the dance because the guys that trained me were, were awesome, even though they never quite made it to the, to the scene. Um, they just they sort of knew the inner workings, but there were a lot of things that they taught me that, that were slightly wrong. Um, a lot of mistakes that I had to make on my own for the, I, I wrestled on the independence for six years before I got hired by WWE. And that was my goal from day one. I, I never said that to anybody. Um, but internally I was like, I want to go to WWE. And then when I started sending tapes, and getting responses from Kevin Kelly. And then I got booked as an extra. Then I was like, okay, I can do this. And I figured all I have to do is just get better every time. Um, I have to show improvement and, you know, I'll eventually get hired. But yeah, I do think that 
the reason that I opened the school in the first place was because I wanted to cut out a lot of those missteps that people have to make. You know, I had to kind of stumble and bumble my way and figure things out. And I'm able to like cut a lot of those corners for people, I think. So you were one of my first ever wrestling interviews. And this was right when your movie was coming out uh, behind mm -hmm. Enemy Lines, Columbia. And I was still working in Toronto at the time. And you were doing like a press tour. And I'll never okay. forget it because I wanted to do your intro. Like on camera, we did the mic check. We were all ready to go. And I was like, hey, it's Chris Van Fleet here with Mr. And then you grabbed the mic. You did the intro. And my cameraman is like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. You should have told me you were going to be yelling. I got to adjust the audio levels now. And I'm like, oh, and both me and you like looked at each other like, oh, we, we got to do the thing again now. It's all right. We did. We did the thing again. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, the, but being backstage at WWE or TNA, they need silence when those backstage interviews. A lot of times they're recorded during the day. Yeah. And yeah. there have been times where it seems like we would record 50 times and we'd get busted by somebody and then cut, 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 got to do it again. So I was kind of used to it at the time, I think. Do you remember like what it was like? Cause you know, you're in WWE, it's city to city to city to city. And then you get put on this movie and now it's not only city to city with WWE and that schedule, but now you're also promoting this other thing. Like were there months when you just weren't home at all? Um, when we filmed the movie, we were gone for like a month. I want to say five weeks. We were in uh, Puerto Rico filming. Um, but I mean, it, it was just kind of the, the minute that I went from being at OVW to being on the road, it was like uh, my life changed. The, the four years that I was at WWE was a complete whirlwind. It was a complete blur to me. There are things that I did that I, I've forgotten until I see a video or something like that, or somebody brings it up and I'm like, oh yeah, I completely forgot about that. It's crazy. But dude, that's just kind of the life. Um, and you learn to sort of love it. Uh, or it or it eats you up i guess um there, there was a story that when i was there when i first started that john cena had been home one day out of 365 days wow. he had been on the road for because he would go from you know wrestling house shows pay-per-views and then he'd have appearances and things like that that he would have to do and this was before he was doing movies so uh that's just kind of that's the way it goes. And, and I always looked at, they would come to me and say, Hey, we've got this uh, appearance for you out in California um, on your day off. Do you want to do it? And, and you know, it would be sometimes like unpaid or we would do interviews with people and they would be unpaid. And some people would complain about that. I always looked at it as this is free advertising for my business, yeah. you know? Um, so I, I love doing it. I love doing it. And yeah, it was just, uh, it was kind of crazy. At what point during your WWE run, or maybe it was when you were in OVW, do you feel like Vince or somebody else in the office kind of pointed at you and went, you, yes, like we're going to strap a rocket to your back because I feel like that's what happened. Was there a specific moment when that happened? There was. Um, I, I, I don't say this with great glee, but... I will say that the best thing that ever happened to me in my career was Jim Cornette pie, uh, slapping, paintbrushing Santino Morella backstage at, at OVW because, <clears throat> excuse me, he, uh, he did that and he got fired and they brought Paul Heyman in. And I had done some stuff with Paul would come down every couple months and he would do a promo day and uh, we would have to come up with an opponent in a two minute promo we would go in and sit in a room with paul and a camera cut the promo then he would give you some feedback a few notes and then you'd go home and fine tune it and come back the next day and cut it again and i remember i would come back and i would sit down and he was always kind of like not standoffish but just professional you know sure. and then i would come back on the second day and i would cut the promo and he would go i love it great uh it's a any notes or anything? Nope. Yeah. Loved it. Thank you. 
And I was like, oh, this guy hates me, you know, like, okay. That's the worst. Sometimes when you're trying to learn and you're trying to get to that next level, that's the worst thing is not hearing anything at all, not hearing any feedback. There's gotta be something that I can do better. Sure. Um, and then when, when that happened and Paul Heyman came in the first day to do TV at OVW, he pulled me into the office and he said, you're the next guy out of here. He literally said those words. He said, you're the next guy out of here. He said, I've been a fan of yours since I saw you when you were an extra, because I, I had been an extra one time and uh, all the extras were in the ring, like doing, like there had to be 10 of us and we were just kind of tagging in and tagging out and you get in there and wrestle and guys were getting in there and they would just chain wrestle. And I remember Davari had been hired at that time already. And he pulled me aside and he was like, that's not what they're looking for. They don't care if you can wrestle. They don't want to see moves. They want to see character. And so uh, when I got in there, I made, I made sure to show some character and stuff. And Jim Ross and Paul Heyman were sitting ringside. They were the only two people there because like everybody else was in a staff meeting or something. And uh, I, I tagged out and Paul said, come here for a second. And I walked over to him. He was like, who trained you? And I was like, um, I got trained by two guys in Green Bay. Um, and then uh, I got polished up and fine tuned by Brad Rangins. And his eyes lit up because Brad Rangins trained Brock Lesnar. Mm. And uh, he was like, and he asked me a couple questions. And, and from that point on, it was like, uh, I think at the end of the day, he gave me his number. And he told me like, call my, call my number next week. Let's talk. And I was like, here we go. You, you became and, a Paul Heyman guy. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, but I would call every week and he would never return my phone calls. So, so, uh, you know, and then fast forward, um, uh, we're in that office and he says, you're the next guy out of here. I've been a fan of yours since that day. And I've loved your promo work and stuff. And I'm going to do so much stuff with you on TV that they're going to have to take notice and you'll get pulled up. And that first night, OVW was in one hour program. And I, I think I had 35 to 40 minutes on that first one hour program that Paul Man. Heyman did. And five weeks later, I got a call from Tommy Dreamer. He said, hey, they want you to come up and uh, they want to see you. And they want you to do your gimmick because I had just started doing the, you know, the announcer thing, announcing my name and saying my last name twice. And uh, and I went up and this was crazy because I was just supposed to do a dark match. It was supposed to be a dark match against Finaki. Finaki was going to win the match. Um, and I was in gorilla position. I'm warming up, doing push-ups going over everything in my head and Vince walked by and Vince would never come up and see the, the dark matches and stuff. Um, he would, he would sit down literally as the pyro was going off or SmackDown or raw or whatever. And he came up and he nodded at me. And then like two minutes later, Dave Lagana came walking around the corner and he said, Hey, there's a, there's been a change. And I immediately in my head, I was like, ah, I got, they're pulling my match. Okay. No big deal. And he said, um, we have to come up with a, a finish for you because you're going over, you're winning the match. Um, and this is no longer going to be a dark match. This is going to be a televised match and welcome aboard. And he stuck out his hand. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. He, and earlier in the day I had gone in and uh, done a promo. Bro Brooklyn Brawler pulled me aside. He's like, hey, come here and cut a promo. And I went in and I just had something in my back pocket because I had cut so many, you know, it's been six years. And, um, and I hit that promo and I remember he said, like, I'm going to tell Vince that was awesome. Wow. And, uh, and he did. So it was like all these things sort of merged together. And I, I, you know, I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. Also. I've heard Jim Ross talk about how you had this star quality about you when he first saw you and that he actually likened it to Stone Cold Steve Austin. Is Austin someone that you looked up to? Big time. Yeah. Like Austin was the reason that I got into the business in the first place. I was not a wrestling fan growing up when Austin started having his run. That's when I started watching wrestling and I watched my friend kind of suckered me into it. And then I would start watching every week just to see what he would do. And then I, and then I was like, well, Undertaker's kind of cool too. And then <laughs> I'm laughing because this is exactly how I got sucked in. My brother really? was a huge wrestling fan and it was rock that I was drawn to. And I'm like, mm -hmm. ah, what's going to happen this week with that guy? Now what's going to yep. happen this week? And then I was sucked right in. Yep. And then, yeah, the rock, I mean, it was 
when I first started watching the rock was a heel and they were chanting die Rocky die for real. Like people really meant it. Yeah. And then he went to, I, he cut some promo. And I remember I was at work. I was a security guard at a nuclear power plant. We'd always have to stand in this room and, you know, the, when you were changing shifts and they'd give you the pass ons from the previous shift and we would just talk wrestling and everybody started like, what about that rock? Uh, what about that promo? Because it was really funny. And then he just, he just kept it up. You worked at a nuclear power plant? I did. Yeah. Man. Okay. Yep. So I, was I, a I, I grew up in security. Pickering, Ontario. There was a nuclear power plant on Lake Ontario there. So I was like, you know, two, three miles from a nuclear power plant, which may explain why my skin glows or something. I don't know. But <laughs> how long did you work at this nuclear power plant? Which one was it? Um, it was Point Beach. It was a Point Beach nuclear power plant in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. And I worked there for probably four years. <clears throat> I was an armed, armed security guard. So, you know, I carried a gun with me. This sounds like a James Bond movie. It was, yeah, I remember uh, I was 19 years old when I took the job and I, I loved it. You know, I get to play cops and robbers. And we would, every once a year, we would do this thing where we would have people come in and try to infiltrate and we would have to make sure that our security measures were up to standard and they worked. Oh so, man. And you know. were also working as a personal trainer too, right? So I didn't start personal training. The reason why I took the personal training gig was I wanted to wrestle and the nuclear security gig, I had to work every other weekend. So I was passing up a lot of opportunities to take bookings. Sure. And um, I moved over here to the Twin Cities and uh, I got a job as a trainer because I figured I could I could train Monday through Thursday. Yeah. I get a free gym membership. Yeah. I'm already there, so I'm definitely going to hit my workouts. And it was just the flexibility. I could travel. I could wrestle Friday, Saturday, and Sunday every week. And that's pretty much what I tried to do for a couple of years. Can and you know, Davari, you know, I had a couple. I got a good crew that I was rolling with. Davari was my, like, he became one of my best friends, which is weird because he's like 10 years younger than me. But it was just like, we had that same, we will do anything. My, my wife is waving at me. She's 10 years younger than me. So <laughs> 15 years younger than me. <laughs> but um, it was it was weirder at the time because Davari was like 19 years old. So, but you know, you no, know, there's a large group of people on this planet, myself included, who can't say Green Bay, Wisconsin without saying Green Bay, Wisconsin. <laughs> nah, you gotta get the uh, nah. Nah. yes, I'd like to thank you for this, Ken. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't Sorry know if everybody that. realizes this. You're actually doing MMA announcing now. I am. Yep. So this I, is, work this, for, I mean, uh, this is great that it was something you kind of started with because you were doing like you were doing it was a basketball announcing originally. That's originally what started the gimmick. It was I did basketball announcing when I was in high school. And, and uh, that becomes part of the gimmick. And look, you know, it's it's full circle yep. here now. Yep. Yep. It was weird. Um, I, one of uh, one of my friends, uh, Samoa Joe, reached out to me and he, he had a friend who um, was trying to get a hold of me because he wanted me to take a shot at boxing announcing. So I went in for top rank and I, I, I auditioned. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, I started doing MMA announcing for a local MMA company. So this has been fun, but I, I, I watch MMA, but I'm not like a student of it, you know? So I, I'm having to learn how everything works, you know? Well, it's so much I, want, I don't just... want to announce the wrong thing, you know. The, <laughs> well, it's so decision. much more than just saying names and weights and hometowns, and I don't know if everybody realizes that. Yeah, it's a lot of like improv, you know. That somebody comes up to you and says, "Hey, I want you to put over X, Y, Z." You have to do that right away. Yeah, yeah. So. And I, I mean, the the ironic part about what you just said is that's what got you over, like. You, at first you were just saying, and then the microphone coming down, the lights, like that became, a, a, grabbing a microphone from the, I'm gonna grab my water bottle. Like grabbing a microphone like this became like a thing uh, because of your gimmick. Uh, it's, it's stupid. I, I didn't change a thing as far as my wrestling goes. I remember like, 
I just started saying my last name twice and I got on TV. I mean, but look, you I really want to like- There's a real lesson to be learned there that it's not just about what you do in the ring. In fact, it yep. may be more about what's your character? Can you sell t-shirts? Are you memorable? I think that's the biggest thing. Yep. I just saw an interview. I think it was uh, Vince McMahon on the Pat McAfee show where he said, like, I don't care about wrestling moves. And I keep trying to, like, drill this into my students. And they're, hey, look at this new move that I came up with. And I'm like, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a jerk. But, like, I'm kind of like, that's cool. But, you know, that doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter in the end. If you can do, if, if you can do 75 cool moves, but you can't talk to a crowd, um, you know, you can't tell a story with your actions. And there's a, a guy who can literally do like a clothesline, a hip toss and a body slam. And that's it. But he, he's got a great character. The WWE and, and the high, you know, they have to hire somebody. They're going to hire the person that can do four things. I think though there's a lot of people that heard Vince McMahon saying, like, I don't care that you're not a great wrestler. And of course, I'm paraphrasing here, but I think there's a lot of people that went, well, well, this is exactly why WWE, the ratings are down. And it's like, no, like it's a different, it's an entertainment business. That's why they got rid of, you know, that's why it's world wrestling entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, and I think it always has been. I mean, granted, there are those who love it for the wrestling. But I think a majority of people that watch wrestling, they like the entertainment value. Well, look, my favorite match of all time is Rock Hogan, WrestleMania 18. I was there because I grew up in you Toronto. Were. And like, as in terms of an actual wrestling match, I mean, not, not great. Nobody's doing nothing crazy. Moves. But the story but, there, <sighs> incredible. And, and the, the fact that when you hear what happened, like they turned, they, they listened to the crowd. They actually listened to the crowd and said, we're going this way instead of, you know, because I believe Rock was supposed to be the baby face and Hogan was the heel, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then and they uh, Hogan, switched it. Hogan told me that when they heard the reaction, they got into the corner. And first of all, he told me, he told Rock, like, slow the F down. And they slowed down. And then they both, you know, basically switched roles. And Hogan also told me, that he didn't realize the NWO was going to turn on him after that match. And that was a decision that was made in Gorilla right after the match. Because the ref just told Mike Kyoto just told him, stay in the ring. And he thought, that's kind of weird. I didn't win. Why would I be staying in the ring? And then sure enough, uh, Nash and Hall came out, turned on him. And like, that was all, they just came up with that. On the spot at WrestleMania. That's crazy. Wow. Is, I... is, the, is the WrestleMania moment for you, WrestleMania 23, holding that briefcase on top of the ladder. Yeah, there it is. Definitely. Definitely. And I remember like, sorry, I just got a phone call. No, he's, it's okay. Um, I remember thinking like that was what I wanted to do when I grabbed it. And I start climbing the ladder and you can see, I look up and I'm like, oh, this isn't going to be a good shot. So I shifted the ladder over. So it's, directly underneath that briefcase um yeah definitely and you know the crazy thing about that was i i remember walking through the curtain and looking out and expecting to see this like you know it's eighty three thousand people that's the most people i had ever wrestled in front of sure and uh it didn't look like it it looked just looked like a really jam-packed you know fifteen thousand seat twenty thousand seat arena so just like um, a Raw or a SmackDown. Yeah. And so then I went, I, I did my match and I showered up and I went up to the boxes because they had a luxury box up there for the family members. And that's when I got over to the window and I looked out and I saw this giant sea of people and this little tiny ring in the center of everything. And, and then it dawned on me what I had just done. It was kind of crazy. But, I mean, when you look at everybody else that was in that match, they're all Hall of Famers or future Hall of Famers. In fact, in fact, do you remember everybody in that match? Uh, I think Randy, Booker T, yeah. Edge, Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy, Finley. Uh, you say Booker? I thought I did, but yeah, Booker, think, yeah, Finley, think, Booker, Finley, yeah. Edge, Matt, Jeff. Punk. Randy Punk, Punk, yeah. that's right. Yeah. And then we had this funny moment because Punk and I, 
were on like I don't know I think it was Punk's first show ever and my second show ever we were at, we were on this show together and uh, it was in like Whitewater Wisconsin and we hadn't talked about it in forever like it had it just hadn't been brought up and the very last thing is Punk and I are up at the top of the ladder and we're trading blows and then I think he goes up and I take a ladder and I knock him off but when we're trading blows he goes uh hey it's kind of a far cry uh we're kind of far away from whitewater wisconsin wouldn't you say like you know we're trading back and forth and it was just kind of a cool moment that i had with him oh um, man i yeah. see a lot of parallels to your run at that point you winning money in the bank to what's going on right now with austin theory and i don't know, do, do you see feel like there's any parallels there i i don't know i i can't say like with uh absolute certainty because i'm not I don't follow closely. Like I, I usually watch because I'm spending so much time at the Academy. Um, I probably don't watch as much wrestling as I should, but uh, I, what I have seen of Austin theory, I love, and I think he's got everything, all the tools necessary. Uh, Vince loves him, right? That, that seems to be the thing. Like, I feel like yeah. Vince thinks he has the look and the skill, Mike skills. Yeah, which, you know, again, sounds a heck of a lot like Ken Kennedy. <laughs> I, I, just I heard a great story that when you were coming up with your name, there was like a meeting because you were going by your, you know, legit name, Ken Anderson. Yep. That there was talk of making your name A-hole because you were an A-hole. <laughs> so, so uh, I... Vince asked me, do you have any catchphrases? And I said, yeah, nice guys finished last. Thank God I'm an asshole. And he was like, we, they had just gone PG. He was like, no, I don't, I don't we can't do that. <laughs> and then Johnny was sitting there. So it was like Johnny, um, Stephanie, Kevin Dunn, Vince. I think that's who, who was all in that room. And uh, Johnny goes, well, hey, hey, how about uh, what if? What if your name was like Adam Hole? And then you could say, nice guys finished last. Thank God I'm an a-hole. And it would be. And I remember Vince just, there was a, a silence in the room. And Vince just looked up at me and he goes, what do you think of that? Uh -oh. And I said, um, I like it. I think it's funny. But I feel like that would be sort of a flash in the pan. Somebody that would be here for like two or three months and then be done. It was it sounds very gimmicky. Mm. And I plan on being here for a long time. And Vince was like, it was like um, almost as though it were a test. Mm. When you but when yeah you, that was when you took Vince's middle name and made it your last name, was there a moment where Vince was like, huh, I see what you're doing here. And I like it. I, I feel like he did. Um because it was Paul that suggested it in the first place. Because I called Paul and I said, hey, they want me to change my name. What do you think? And he was like, uh, you know, you have to pick something that is near and dear to his heart. Um, and he was like, his dog's name is Ruckus or Rumpus. I think he had two dogs at the time. But what about Kenny Rumpus? Kenny Ruckus? Uh, uh, no. And then I had, uh, I was Kamikaze Ken when I started in the Indies and I had these like backwards K's and I wanted to sort of like keep that as my logo. Yeah. I was like something with a K and he was Kennedy is his middle name. And then I remember when, uh, when we were in that room and I said that he just paused for me and he goes, Oh, I don't think there's ever been a Kennedy. Do you like it? And I was like, I like Ken Anderson to be honest with you, but you can call me Mr. Dickhead if you want to, it's your company. <laughs> And he just kind of smirked and uh, then he looked at Kevin Dunn and he goes, make sure he's got Kennedy on his tight front tonight. And that was, that was the second week. That was the, the week that I debuted on SmackDown. So the first two yeah. weeks that I was there on TV, um, I was Anderson. Wow. Yeah. So when you, when they're talking about you winning money in the bank and you do win the match, are there plans at that time for like, all right, you're going to win it here at WrestleMania 23. Did they already have the plans written out of when you were going to cash in? Yeah, the idea was that I would cash it in at next year's WrestleMania. That was the plan. They said right. it. I announced it right away, I believe. You did, yeah. But, I mean, and, plans <clears throat> change, I feel like. Yeah, and, and that was the plan. And then a few months later, I, I feel like I only had it a month and a half, two months maybe. 
and they came to me. Uh, I was I was riding with Matt Hardy. We had left the building early, which was unlike us. We usually stayed until the very end. For whatever reason, that day we left early. And I got a call from uh, uh, Michael Hayes, and he said, "Where are you guys? I need you to come back. Vince needs to talk to you in his office." So I scurried back to the building. And I was walking into his office. And by the time we got back there, everybody had pretty much filed out. So it was an empty building. And I remember Batista coming out of Vince's office and we passed each other in the hall. And he just came up to me and he gave me a big hug. And he was like, you, you deserve it, bro. And I, you know, I played stupid. I was like, what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? He was like, oh, just, you know, go in there. The, I, I want them to tell you. So I went in and it was Vince and Stephanie. And they said, look, we had planned on having taker as the champion for like a really long time unfortunately he's injured towards biceps i believe and he needs to have surgery so we are going to next week and he laid out the scenario basically and uh, he's, he's like and uh you're gonna cash in your briefcase we're gonna have a new champion and uh and he i remember him telling me that they were high on batista at the time that was their guy and that if batista you know, sometimes guys are better when they're chasing the title. When they have it, they kind of like their, their ratings kind of dip. And they felt like Batista needed to chase for a while. And they said, you know, um, when we feel the, the time is right, we're going to put it on Batista. But we don't know how long that could be. It could be like a month or five months or six months, whatever. And I remember I just said, like, look, I appreciate you guys saying that, but uh, this is business and I'll, I'll do it what's necessary. And then the very next time I wrestled, I got clotheslined and I hit the mat and I felt something pop in my triceps. I rolled out to the floor and I remember Finley came out and he looked at me and he goes, that doesn't look good. And uh, by the time I got downstairs, it was already, my arm was swollen up. I couldn't bend it. It was starting to change colors already, which is really weird because you know, bruising normally takes like a week, like those deep bruises. Yeah. And then I went to, I, I went to, I remember Hornswoggle drove me to the emergency room in Erie, Pennsylvania. I got an MRI. And then the next day, Stephanie called me in my hotel room and she's like, Ken, you tore your triceps off the bone. We're going to have to, uh, we still need to get that title off of Taker though. So we're sending Vince this jet to pick you up. We're going to take you to Penn State. You're going to, Edge is going to challenge you for the briefcase and then he's going to go on and do what you were supposed to do tomorrow night. Oh. Okay. And I remember thinking at the time, like, I've got a year to cash this thing in. Isn't there some other way that you can get it off? But I, I didn't say it. I sort of regret not saying it now. But, um, and then I went in. Edge called me a chicken. I said, nobody calls me chicken. And I gave up the briefcase. The next day, I flew to Birmingham, Alabama. I'm sitting on Doc Andrews' table. And he's feeling my triceps. And he's like, that's not a tear. And I was like, uh, excuse me? And he goes, no, I don't, I don't feel a tear in there. There's not a tear there, I'm pretty sure. So we did another MRI and sure enough, it was just a bruise. It was like a large bunch of blood vessels burst inside my triceps. And he said, you'll be out for four or five weeks. And then that was it. So kind of a crazy. How did, how did that derail all the momentum that you had though? Because I feel like it it could be just a month later, you're back in the title picture, you know, and like you challenge edge again. I mean, it was frustrating, but I knew that that's just the way the business rolls. You know, they, the, the job of a WWE writer has to be the worst job in the world and the, or the hardest because yeah. most writers that write for television shows, you know, you had 22 episodes in a season. These guys have to come up with content, you know, every single week plus it's not just they're not just writing for one show they're writing for raw and smackdown and then they have to come up with content for the pay-per-views and online content and stuff so i i get it like sometimes they just hey they're, they're it's a mad scramble people get hurt what are we going to do what are we going to do that's not the same you know that's not just completely abandoning everything so it was frustrating um, and it had happened to me a couple times at that point. So it was, uh, that was really frustrating, but it was what it was. And I just thought like, I'll bounce back. I'll be okay. Yeah. 
I, I feel like your name is thrown around so often in these like what if conversations. How does it make you feel knowing that like your WWE career is like a what if? Um, it's a good question. Um, I, you know, externally, I like, you know, everybody, I have no regrets and I, I am what I am today because of the things that happened to me. And, but I, but it, there is that part of me that I, I heard somebody yesterday said, if you could relive your best moment, if you could either relive your best moment or redo your worst moment, what would you mm. do? And I think I would redo my worst moments, you know? Um, yeah, there, there's a, and I guess what I'm able to do now with that is I, I can't change the past, obviously, right. but I can hopefully pass that information along to my, to my students, you know? Is, does winning the TNA championship twice, does that make you feel like you did reach the top of the mountain? But no, no, I, I think, you know, and that's nothing against TNA, but like, they just weren't the same. Yeah. You know? and it, yeah, it wasn't the same and, uh, but, but it's okay. Like, I'm not, you know, I'm not crying my oatmeal about it. Like it is what it is. We got to move on. But yeah, it's there. I do have some regrets, for sure. Is there any point when you're making a name for yourself in TNA, when you're the, you know, when you're the guy in TNA, that WWE kind of goes, oh, oh, look what Kent's doing these days. Do you ever hear from them? I had heard, I had heard that from somebody in the office that Vince had said, I, I think I, he, he regretted pulling the trigger so quickly on, on firing me. Mm. And I probably should have like reached out at the time, but I had such a huge chip on my shoulder. I had a chip on my shoulder for years from, you know, the way that I left WWE. And, uh, and, you know, and today I, I will say, honestly, like that was all my fault. Like I'm, I am responsible. Nobody did anything to me. I did it to myself. So, um, you know, it was just the, the straw that broke the camel's back there at the end. Um, but that's that I heard that. And then uh, at some point I cut a promo and I remember Randy Orton texting me and saying, you know, like I was an awesome promo and I believe he was being serious. I don't think he was being sarcastic, but. I feel like though but, it takes a lot of self-awareness now though, to be able to go. Yeah, that, that was my fault. I did that because I can imagine at the time you didn't feel that way. Yeah. I definitely didn't want to take ownership for it at all. I, I wanted it to be somebody else's, you know, some a bunch of people conspired against me to get me fired. You know, I, I should have never been in the position any in the first place where other people could conspire against me at all. You know, like, right. I think it was just a matter of like, I kept saying things and doing things. And I really, to be honest, I sort of phoned it in for the last couple of years. I, I made it there and, and it, you know, I took my foot off the gas. I really did. And um, I don't remember exactly where I was going with that. <laughs> I took my foot off the gas, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the really interesting facts about your career in WWE is you were Eddie Guerrero's last match. And I don't know if, I mean, I think, I think a lot of people obviously remember you know, the shocking news when he passed, but a lot of people don't remember, you know, what happened before that. What are your memories of that? last match with Eddie? Um, I remember, I remember him telling me to calm down in the beginning. There was some, we did some chain wrestling. I remember I was scrambling to get to the ropes quickly to break. And I remember him telling me like, just calm down. Like you don't have to go so quickly there. Um, and then I remember in the, we were talking through the match. I'm supposed to hit him with the chair at the end. And I remember he said, like, bring it, like hit me with it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to hit you with it. And then I hit him with it and we got backstage and he was like, maybe a little too much. <laughs> like, um, but uh, then we went out to dinner that night. I was riding, I was actually riding with him and him and Benoit at the time. And we went to a steakhouse and I remember they were talking because the next week 
after it was like a super show in Minneapolis. It was Raw and SmackDown. I'm not sure if ECW was around at the time yet, but it was going to be Raw, Raw and SmackDown uh, super show. And then we were heading to the airport. We were going to fly out and do my first international tour. And they were like, you know, you're going to get, they're going to mess with you. They're going to shave your eyebrows while you're sleeping, you know, stuff like that. To, um, get me all riled up for the, and then I remember I pulled into the arena and the guy that parks the cars that helps park, park all the vehicles told me, he's, he's like, Eddie died. And uh, I walked into the building and it was just like this crazy, sick feeling that everybody had all day. Everybody was super somber, and sad. It was, uh, it was a crazy, crazy day. I feel like it, you know, it just must have been such a whirlwind of everything that was going on. And then the show still ends up going on. Yeah. And I, I will say that with all of the death that I have personally, like people that I've known, even if it was just briefly, um, people that I've known that have passed away in this business in the last 23 years since I started yeah. has really sort of um it almost like deadens you to to the you know when i hear of somebody dying it's like that's too bad you know like i hate that i feel that way um and i don't it's not like i don't care it's just we've experienced so much of it that uh, i don't i don't know what that is i've never gone to a, a wrestler funeral either i've never yeah. done that Whose death do you think hit you the hardest? Um, it's probably Shad. Um, just because of like the way that it happened and yeah. what he did. It was a good dude. I remember reading that story and I had tears rolling down my face. I, I just texted Chad, Chad like a few weeks before that we were supposed to do an interview. And I'm reading this story, obviously saddened that he passed away. But then like the, the fact that he sacrificed his own life for his son's life, it's just, I, that just tells you how special of a person he was. Yeah, it's, and, and we all hope that we would do that. in that moment, but he did. Yeah. Sorry. No, I've, I'm sorry for bringing it up. <laughs> no. no, it's okay. I mean, I think it's good to talk about like, I, it was it's real. It was, it was so nice to see WWE honor him this year because so often when someone leaves the company, it's like, you know, you're, you're gone and forgotten. And it was so nice that it was like, you're, you're still remembered and we want to acknowledge you for this incredible act of heroism. Yeah, it was really, it was really something else to see. Yeah, you, you're right. Normally everybody, you know, if somebody dies, they get a rip at the beginning of Raw. Um, but uh, yeah, that was pretty special. It really was Good to have his son and his wife there. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's just, it's crazy to think of everything that goes on. You know, I, I've been kind of in the industry, but I've been mostly at arm's length my whole career as just a fan, you know, a fan that's had the opportunity to talk to so many incredibly talented people. But when you're in this for 23 years and you have to explain everything that's going on here, the travel and you know, the changes on the fly and all of this stuff and then dealing with losing your friends. I don't think there's any other career like this in the world. I really don't. I, I, I honestly don't. And like, I think that the humor that wrestlers have because of just the craziness, um, we have to like edit ourselves when we're on civs, you know, like SoCal Val always says, you got to edit yourself when you're around the civilians. So um, civs. That's so good. <laughs> uh, because like, you know, we'll say stuff and we'll, we'll think it's funny, but like, if you said that in front of any 
normal human being, they would think you were absolutely crazy. It's a little um, bit like the world of comedy, I feel like, because when yeah, you probably. Be a comedian, yeah, you got to do the same thing. You got to travel town to town just for stage time. You might make a few dollars, you might not. I feel like it's very similar. Yeah, you're making, yeah, they make jokes that like some something tragic happens and like they're immediately in the car that day telling jokes to each other that they know that they can't tell to the audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there is a lot of a lot of parallels between stand up and, and and pro wrestling. If the moment for you in WWE is is this, it's holding the briefcase at WrestleMania twenty three. What's the moment for you in TNA? Um, I think it was honestly it was when I I said something like um, I was tagging with Jeff Hardy. And I said something like, because um, the week before I had said, nice guys finished last night, God, man. Vince would never let me do that. And I always envisioned that as like a t-shirt. I envisioned the crowd, because at the time they would chant, you're an asshole or something yeah. like that to Vince. And I remember thinking, what if it was like, you know, in a positive way, you're an asshole. Like, and um and Vince, I just couldn't convey that to him. And uh, one of my biggest regrets was WrestleMania 23, after I won that Money in the Bank briefcase, Michael Hayes came up to me and he goes, they want you to cut a promo afterwards. And they want it to be your Austin 316 moment. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to say it, you know, and uh, I'm going to hit the hit the line. I, nice yeah. guys, nice guys. Thank God I'm an asshole and I'm going to walk off. And I remember all right, I better just ask, I better ask. And so I asked permission. And of course, at the time, there was no swearing, no cursing, but it was, it was WrestleMania. I thought I'd get away with it. And I would have gotten away with it too. Um, but I asked permission and they said no. And so, you know, that's the worst thing. Like if you ask for permission, they say, no, you can't do it. Yeah, that's it's better, you know, that, that phrase of like beg for forgiveness rather than ask for permission. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I just felt it in the moment. Oh, and yeah, I should yeah. have done that. I so won't do it again. Line? What was the Austin 316 it, moment for you? It was the, and then, uh, and then, so it ended up, uh, it ended up being kind of a flop, right? I, I said something like, nice guys finished last. Thank God I'm Mr. Um, which doesn't hit as well as nice guys finished last. Thank God I'm an asshole and walk off. And then uh, I said it in TNA because they let me do it. And and then uh, they, the crowd started chanting, we are assholes, we are assholes. And like, and then I got a t-shirt and it was, you know, pretty hot selling t-shirt at TNA. And I just remember thinking like with the WWE marketing machine behind something like that, it, it would have been a lot better. One of the big things I remember about your time in TNA was the cage match with Kurt Angle and his insane moonsault off the top <laughs> on yeah. basically your face. He didn't touch me. One, it was, uh, he's a true professional. Um, there's a lot of kind of funny memories about that match. One was they had given us 23 minutes. And on the day, like, time, had, 23 minutes, not 20, yeah. not 25. Yeah. It was like 23 minutes. And I remember on the day, so they had told us that for weeks leading into it. And Kurt is the kind of person that likes to put things together in his head way ahead of time. Like two or three weeks before he came up to me and he was like, hey, I pretty much got you know a bunch of our match figured out. And I, I just, I'd never worked with anybody like that. And uh, so he had you know planned out this big long thing. And then on the day they said they cut 10 minutes out of the match. So it went from 23 to 13, which is a huge difference. And that's including entrances? Yep. Oh, yeah. 13 total. It's curtain to curtain, 13. And I remember he said, like, we're going 23. <laughs> and I was like, we are? And he goes, yep. He goes, don't worry about it. I'll take the heat. Okay, I remember we're in the match and Slick was our man, our uh, referee, 
And Slick kept going, come on, take their saying, go home. They're screaming in my ear. And Kurt turned to him and said, I don't care. And and then I think Slick turns to the hard cam and he just kind of gave one of those. Like, But we ended up going the full time. Um, and the other thing was they did not want him doing the moonsault off the top of the cage. So he just said, we're going to do it anyways. But don't tell anybody about it. And uh, Dio was our agent. He was our producer. And he came up to me afterwards and he was like, uh, what that moonsault off the top of the cage? Did you know that was going to happen? I was like, nope. And he just smirked and walked away like he knew. But uh, didn't get any heat. The, the only heat that we got was, I remember AJ and, and Ric Flair were pretty upset because their time got cut. So they had some, some time for their match too. And theirs ended up getting cut down because we went so long. I did feel bad about that, though. But well, that was the only thing. Flair, I feel like the timing here is good because mm -hmm. his last match, I mean, his last, last match is yeah. next weekend. What What do you think about him? Is this his last match? And what do you think about it? Um, You know, I I don't know. Like, he's, he's like a, he's like a cyborg. You know, he just keeps ticking. I I just, I hope that the match goes well. I, I just want it to be entertaining, you know? Um, and I think it will. I think, uh, I think they're, they're doing a tag match, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that he'll come in and he'll do his Ric Flair stuff and everybody it's else. It's a tag match with two guys who could really work, Andrade and Jay Lethal on either side. So like, I feel yeah. like Jeff Jarrett and Flair are kind of like, like you said, get their stuff in and make it a memorable yeah. match. I think it'll be cool. I really do. Do you think he'll go over? You know, I don't know. I, I feel like he's kind of like Taker in the sense that he believes in that old school, you go out looking up, looking up at the lights. Yeah. You know, like that's the time honored tradition in our business. When you're done, you do the favors for somebody on the way out the door. Um, I feel like I feel like probably the other team will win, but it feels like it makes sense, right? Yeah, you're but still work, you're maybe still working not, a lot, right? Not a lot, but I'm I'm starting to starting to take more bookings. Um, I took a couple couple years off when the pandemic occurred, or even right before that. I got I injured my groin somehow. I was wrestling one of my students on a show. And I crotched myself on the top turn buckle and I just <laughs> I couldn't walk for like three months. Um, so I just kind of took some time off and I'm really starting to get back into it. Being that I'm, I have so many great students. They're, they're sort of fueling that passion for me again. And being that, I, you know, I'm at a gym, the place that we're at is a, a boxing gym, which is also a, uh, there's also a full weight room there and everything. So once a lot of the reason why I'm there until two o'clock in the morning is because I'm, you know, working out at 1 a.m. So I, I plan on taking more bookings coming up here. I'm not done for sure. I feel like with your mic skills, you could be a great manager or like general manager in WWE. Like, I feel like you could really fill that role. So well. I would love, I would like something like that for sure. Where? I, where? I, go ahead. I was going to say, where did your mic skills come from? Because it feels, as a fan, it feels like innate. Like, it just feels like it was so natural for you. Um, from the time I was a little kid, I, I remember I'd tell jokes. And I, I always wanted to be an actor or a comedian or something like that. Um, so, I, you know, I, I did play acting when I was in high school and forensics. We took stage. We went to state got gold medals three years in a row. Um, I was in some plays and stuff like that. And I, and I love speech class. So it was just kind of something that I just sort of gravitated to. And when I first started in the business, I remember like studying guys like The Rock. And I made sure that when I was on a show, that if the promoter would let me, I would, I would grab a microphone and, and cut a promo and work on my mic skills. And uh, there, 
the first company that I worked for actually had a little television show locally and they did a lot of backstage interviews and stuff like that. So I've got a chance to like hone those skills a little bit there. I just feel like your skills are still untapped. I feel like, feel like you could be putting these to great use if given the opportunity. Maybe, maybe. I, <laughs> I, I guess we'll see. But I've with, been, you know, I've, I've been getting in the ring a lot more and rolling around with with some of my students. I have, uh, I, I have a couple students right now that have WWE tryouts. Um, one guy that signed to WWE. Um, Who's that? That's uh, Gable Stevenson. He's been training with us. Um, he, you know, he's local. He lives in the Twin Cities, and he's been signed now to Raw for a year. Yeah. And they really haven't done much with him. So he just wanted to like he he reached out and said, "Hey, can I come in and like just hit the ropes and stuff?" So we've been doing a couple times a week with him, and I've got some of my best students working with him. I feel I feel like there's a lot of high hopes for Gable and what he's capable of, especially seeing the path that's been um, blazed before him by people like Kurt Angle or Brock Lesnar or Shelton Benjamin. I feel like Gable has like high asper or high high expectations of him and like really big shoes to fill. He does definitely. Um, he's got some amazing innate ability that you just can't teach somebody. The first time I remember he, he came in and I said, what do you know how to do? And he goes, nothing. Uh, I said, Have you taken a bump yet? And he said, I've never taken a bump. Do you know how to hit, run the ropes? And he knew how to run the ropes, kind of. And uh, so I told him how to take his first bump. And normally I go through this whole progression where I have people hold on to the rope and then they take a fall back and, and push him over somebody's back. And mm. I just said, like, tuck your chin you know drive your drive your hips up to the ceiling and you want to land in your in your upper shoulder area yeah and he went boom and did it almost perfectly and then i told him you know to get up the certain way we get up to our right and he got up the wrong way and i i didn't even have to say anything he he remembered halfway through and he like reversed himself back down and then got up the right way and i feel like that happens all the time he's already kind of having matches with couple of our guys um he's gonna be great i think he just needs to tap into his um, his his verbal skills yeah and the thing is he's super charismatic and he can't talk he really can um it's just getting him to sort of take it to 10 because he's just a chill guy he's kind of relaxed not stressed about anything so, if, I mean, I know it's really early on, but whose wrestling style would you say his mimics or looks like? I, I mean, I would say the, the closest is Kurt because he's just got that natural wrestling ability that you can see the way that he moves. You know, he does headlock takeovers with the gable grip, which is, you know, a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people like this grip here. Um, mm. But I think when he does it, it just looks so natural. Um, there's some elements of like chain wrestling where I don't even, I haven't even told him. He just, he does stuff that works. And uh, uh, I, I really, I think he's going to be great. I can't wait to see him make his debut. And I'm hoping it's sooner rather than later. But with that said, I hope that when it does happen, like that it, it's done the right way definitely yeah and i hope that they don't try to you know have him fill those shoes like i hope they let him be the first gable stevenson not the next kurt angle you know mm. not the next brock lesnar well he's got a great teacher and i think that's pretty helpful <laughs> thank you look ken i've really enjoyed this i'm so glad we had like a full like hour to be able to like chat and hang out because the other interviews that we've done before have been like really short and i'm glad yeah. that we were able to like chat about everything here so i like i super appreciate you taking the time to do this i i just want to say because i i told this to you before when we weren't recording but i really appreciate what you're doing i love your content i think it's awesome i think you legitimize you you're not just uh, uh somebody 
sniffing for dirt. Um, it, it, you're a genuine reporter and you legitimize this business that I love and I appreciate everything that you do. So, and I saw the congratulations on the 100,000 subscribers to your YouTube channel. I uh, hope you get a million. Thank you. That's, that's on my second channel. So I'm hoping that both channels can hit a million, but thank you nice. so much for the kind words. And like, you've always been so kind to me. So I really appreciate that. And I end every conversation with the same question because I really believe in gratitude. And I wake up every morning, I say out loud three things that I'm grateful for. So Ken, for you, what are three things in your life that you're grateful for? Um, I'm grateful for uh, a partner that I have who supports me in everything that I do. Uh, grateful for two awesome kids. And uh, that I'm able to have this, I, I had these experiences in my life and I'm able to pass them on to other people. You know, uh, seeing my kids do the things that I did, that I was excited for is, is more exciting than it was when I did it almost. So. Do we have some future WWE champions in your case? I think so. You, you know, like we already have a fairly good track record um, with some of our students. We've got six, six of our students are either working for WWE or AEW. You know, Darius Martin, Dante Martin, they were both graduates from the academy. It's Tiffany Stratton, who's kind of tearing it up in NXT, Von Wagner, Cal Bloom, uh, he trained with us. Um, Julia Hart from AEW. And uh, there was another guy that came. He, he just did a, like a WWE tryout. He was an athlete. His name was Randy. I can't remember what they're doing with him. Though. He's at NXT 2.0. Um, so, and I think that we have some others that are like, those people are doing fantastic, but uh, there's a guy that we have that's doing a tryout in just two weeks, I believe. And I think... He's going to take the world by storm. Honestly. Well, what's his name? Got, so we can say his, I knew him when. <laughs> his name is uh, Rampage Santana. And, and I think that uh, he has all the tools, every single tool necessary to be successful in the business. He can talk. He can wrestle. He's got charisma. Um, he's young. He's 22 years old. So. Wow. What and about in your household? You have future yeah. WWE champions in your household? <laughs> um. Neither of the kids are really into wrestling. Um, my daughter. You're like, thank God. <laughs> kind of, you know, yes, yes and no. If, if they ever come to me and say, and they, they both have, but I think it was just like, they were trying to make dad feel good. Yeah. Like dad, we want you to, I want you to train me how to wrestle. But they're eight and they don't watch wrestling at all. Um, our daughter started playing. Like, somebody brought in WWE 2K. 22 to the school and she was playing it on the on the playstation there um and she really liked it she liked playing as Rey mysterio but uh i don't know if any if it's either one of them i would say it's probably our daughter that's going to be the she's like a little daredevil that's great but if they if they if it's something they truly want to do i'll i hope i'll be there to you know hold their hand and and guide them if they want to do something completely different, that's, it's up to them, you know? Yeah. It's something I'm not going to push on them for sure. Well, Ken, thank you again. So good to catch up with you. And yeah. I look forward to our paths crossing in person again soon. Yes. Thank you. Are, are you not at, you're not at the Comic-Con this weekend? I'm going to be uh, at StarCast next weekend. Will I see you there? Uh, no. Where's that? Is that Nashville for like SummerSlam? I, San Diego Comic-Con is going on right now, right? Yeah, it starts tomorrow, I think, yeah. Oh, okay. Do you go out to those? I should. I live an hour and a half away. Now that I've said this out loud, everyone's going to be like, what do you mean you don't go? Never? You've never been to one? I've never been. You're, you're right. I should, I should make this happen now. You should. You should go meet up with Mike Kingston. Then, I know, you Mike know Mike Kingston. Okay. Is Mike yeah. bringing you in? Uh, Mike has brought me in there a few times um i'm not i'm not at this one but it's definitely something you need to do you need to experience it i should go especially it's since it's cool. drivable 
Yeah. And the, the mixture of wrestling and comic books and movies and video games is just, yeah. I mean, that's every time I leave one of those, I go, probably shouldn't have spent so much money on, uh, uh yeah. 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 I, I don't even collect a lot of like autographs or memorabilia unless it's like something that means like a ton to me. Actually, I'll show you one because it's sitting right here. I'm so proud of this one. Back to the Future is my favorite movie of all time. And I got a license plate signed nice. by Christopher Lloyd and Michael J. Fox. That's incredible. And I was thinking to myself, like I, I had the opportunity to get this and I was like, I, unfortunately, they're both not going to be around at some point in time. Hopefully that's no time soon, but right. while we still have the chance, you know, and now I got to find a great place to hang this. Maybe I'll hang it that's, behind me here somewhere. That's awesome. That's okay. your favorite movie? Thank you again. Yeah, favorite movie of all time. And um, awesome. I've, without getting uh, too into the weeds on this, I just love the concept of the movie, how it's about decisions. And actually, we talked about that quite a bit during this conversation. It's about like how if this thing doesn't happen, then that thing doesn't happen. And if you turn left here instead of turning right, then this thing in your life doesn't happen. Like if Marty's dad wasn't a peeping Tom and then fell into the road and then got hit, none of this would have happened. And I find that idea that concept so fascinating that butterfly effect right like that's it yeah and yeah. that that and then the reason that we're sitting here right now doing the things we're doing is because of all of the things that happened in our life before and that because idea jim, fascinates me it's become because jim Cornette paintbrush santino morell <laughs> and thank you again yep thank you thanks brother appreciate you man